Go ahead and turn with me to 1 Corinthians. We will spend the majority of our night in 1 and 2 Corinthians tonight. At the start of the year, we talked about how we were going to spend some Sunday nights going through all of the books in the New Testament. Now that's going to take up about half of our Sunday nights through the year. And so far we've went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Acts, and Romans. And I appreciate those who have commented about these uh, particular lessons. One has even asked if we could have a, either a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. I'm going to try to do it on a Wednesday night, a Bible class on the book of Romans. So I hope we can do that. The reason we're doing these, and I want to spend time with us talking about that before we get into it. The reason we're doing things this way through the year is to get us to recognize that we need to go through the New Testament every year. And there are a variety of ways that we can do that. I believe it would be beneficial for every one of us to go through the New Testament four times a year. It doesn't take that long if you break it up in a quarter to go through the New Testament in, in, in one quarter. That's three months to go through the New Testament. But I believe this is one of those ways we can go through the New Testament because the New Testament helps us in a way to understand that there are always going to be problems. There always have been problems, but what we've got to focus on, what we've got to recognize is our response to the world that we live in and our response to the Lord that's done everything for you and me. And of course, as you know, as you think about the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, you know that in these books there are problems. You know you get into 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and there are problems that are in the church you get into 2 Corinthians. Now, all through that entire chapter, that book, Paul's going to defend his apostleship because there were people coming into Corinth saying, no, Paul couldn't come in here and tell you any of those things. He shouldn't have told you those things. He shouldn't have called that what it was. And he has to defend his apostleship. You know what that tells me in the Corinthian church? There were problems, not only in the first letter, but also in the second letter because Paul had to defend himself in that second letter. But what we recognize as we study these books, especially in the books of 1 and 2 Corinthians, is there is power in unity. There is power in unity. You know, when it comes to unity, our world likes to use that word. And we need to be unified together. And we need, to be, we need to come together as one. But you know, many times our world uses that word, and I just don't think they know what that word means, do you? We all cannot be unified if we all have these different ideas about how the world should be run. Or we all can't be unified if we're all living all of these different types of lives. And let me make it biblical for you for just a minute. We all cannot be unified unless we're unified inside of Scripture, which is in Christ. And anything outside of Christ is going to be division that's going to be caused. And what was happening in 2 Corinthians was division. Oh, Paul should have never said that. He should have never wrote a letter condemning that. And yet there they were, dividing the Lord's body. And that was a problem that was within the church. But this book, these two books talk about, in their essence, about unity. Now how we're going to divide our discussion tonight, because we have more ground to cover tonight than we're probably ever going to have to cover in this series, because these are two lengthy books, but they are two weighty books. They're filled with good materials that we need to know. We're going to look at general information, which I love, because if you're going to study a book, know what you're studying and know what it's going to take you. Number two, I want to look at a section called the main matters. There are two things that I believe are central to these two books. And if we miss these two things, we really won't understand what the books are really about. And then I want us to look at a section that's entitled Lessons Learned. And, and these two things, very specifically, should help us in the way that we live. You know, I think every one of us, can understand and maybe could say this about our lives, we could live better. And I think we could all say in our Christian lives we could study better or, or, or maybe we could put God first better. But in these books, there are these two things we're going to see in the lessons learned. And I think that will make us better because what these two books teach us is to put self last. To put self last we live in a first-person society. We're not told to put ourselves last. We're told to be number one. We're, we're told to exert our authority to get what is due to us. But that's not Christian living, is it? And I believe these two books 
are going to teach us how we can learn to be better in that area. So let's talk about some general information. Now to do this, we're going to break our study up all the way through our night in First and Second Corinthians because we've got to cover both books to get the idea and to get through what we have tonight. But when we go into First Corinthians, it's really interesting when you start First Corinthians. I love this. Paul... We know who wrote it. We know who he's talking to. He's writing to the Corinthian church. Now, he writes this first letter about 54 to 57 A.D. Now, keep that in mind when we get to the second letter and see how closely connected these two letters are. Some will assert that he definitely wrote it on the year of 57 A.D., and he was one who wrote from Ephesus. But that range of 54 to 57 A.D. will get you through and exactly what you need to know about the date of this book. Now, this is something I find interesting. If you sit down tonight, after we leave here, and you spend one hour in 1 Corinthians, by the time you get done, if you read at an average pace of an American today, you will have read 1 Corinthians in one hour. It's a short study. It's a short book if you'll read it. It's the 46th book inside of the New Testament. It's the seventh book, or inside of the Bible, it's the seventh book of the New Testament. And it's 20 or second of 21 epistle books, which is the Romans through Jude books. It's third of Paul's 13 books, and 20 are going to follow it inside of the New Testament. 16 chapters. Listen, if you only read a chapter a day, it would take you 16 days. That doesn't take us long at all, will it? 16 chapters. 437 verses. It's short, really. But the content inside of this book is rather vast, and it has a word count of 9,489 words if you're using the King James Version. Now, when you move over into this particular book, you're going to find a key verse, and I want you to go there in your paper Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians 10, and I want you to see something about this key verse. It's the key verse I've picked for the book. And this particular verse has to do with the way we live. It has to do with the way we look at the world. Now, there are two ways to look at the world, in my opinion. Now, this is just an opinion. I can look at the world as if the world owes me something, or I can look at the world as if I can live here and go to heaven. I can look at the world as if it owes me something, or I can look at the world as if I can be here and I can go to heaven. And that's what's happening in 1 Corinthians 10, especially verses 1, and you make your way all the way down to verse 14. Verses 1 through 14 in 1 Corinthians 10 really gives us a history of God's people. It starts, if you'll look in verse 2, with Moses and those who were in the cloud and the sea, those who left Egypt. And guess what you learned about those people? They faced temptation. Now we're going to learn inside of this in verse 5, many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. You look at verse 4, you see what happened to them. They were involved with Christ. And verse 6, you read this. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after the evil things as they also lusted. There are things we should avoid in this world, and that's nothing that's new. You follow it all down, you'll find out that there are more things that the people of Israel did. And verse 11 says these things happened to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. It's interesting that Scripture has been written so that we can learn from history. Now notice the key verse. This is how you've got to look at the world. Picking up in verse 12. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. Now I want you to go ahead and read verse 14 so you get the context of this. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I picked this particular section to help us understand it's the way we look at the world. Does the world owe me anything or can I go to heaven? And the answer is I can go to heaven. I love verse 14. I almost picked it as the key verse, but I didn't think it got the whole, whole, whole book in inside of it. Flee from idolatry. Let us never think we're the only people who've ever been tempted. Let us never think that we're the only people who've dealt with hard times. Let us never put ourselves on the pedestal to think that we're the only people who have ever gone through tough times or temptations. He says, flee from idolatry. It's idolatry of self. And thus I chose this as the key verse, for the, the verses before it. If we don't recognize where we are, we're going to fall, verse 12. And verse 13, there's nothing that we're going to face that's not common to man. 
There's nothing that we're going to face that's not common to man. And isn't that good to know that God is on our side, especially if you look at the last part of verse 13, but God is faithful. You know, we need to know more and more in the world we live, God's faithful. God is there for you and me. God is still there for the world, and God is still going to do what he says, and he's promised us heaven if we're willing to live for him. But not only that, we recognize here he's promised us a way of escape. In times of temptation, there is always an avenue to do the right thing. The problem is we put ourselves on that pedestal. No one's ever had to endure this like I have, so they wouldn't have made the same decision that I had. And we justify the way we live. 1 Corinthians, I believe, has a key verse of verses 12 and 13 of 1 Corinthians 10. Now, when you enter into 2 Corinthians, remember how this started. Paul's still the writer. Now, he wrote this letter from 57 to 58. Remember, letter 1 was written from 54 to 57. Letter 2 is written from 57 to 58. Now, most people believe that this letter was written in 57. Now, the majority of folks also believe that 1 Corinthians was also written in 57. So that gives you an idea that Paul wrote the first letter, and a very short window of time took place before he wrote the second letter. Now, if you know anything about these letters, Paul is addressing a variety of problems in the church at Corinth. It's not shocking to me that it was written so closely together to defend who he was, to defend what he wrote about, and defend where his authority came from, that is Jesus Christ. Now, if you read this book, go home, sit down, read it tonight, it'll take you 45 minutes. It's just a little bit shorter than the previous book. Now, it's an interesting particular section of where it falls. There's 19 books to follow. So you see, as we're going through our study, the New Testament begins to come to a close after these more lengthy books. Now, 13 chapters, 257 verses, and only 6,902 words. That is less. Both of these books combined is almost the average words used in a sermon. So it will take you less time to read this book than it would take to do a sermon on the entire book. Now, in this, there's a key verse. Go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, and I want you to go down with me in verse 17. Now, we know what happens in 1 Corinthians 5. There's a man who's living in sin. He needs to get out of that. I love 2 Corinthians because he builds the case for those who are Christians to be new creatures. And thus, I've chose this as the passage that should be the key to the book. It reads this way, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. When you became a Christian, the way you thought had to change. I don't think we talk about that very often. The way we think has to change. How how do we usually think if we're going to live like the world? We think about self. We think about self-promotion. We think about self-exaltation. We think about how self can be rewarded. The way I think has got to change. You know, when you become a Christian, all things are become new. The way I act must change. Things I used to do, if they were sinful, I'm not going to do those things anymore. The way I live is going to change. And that tells you and me something about becoming a child of God. I'm going to forsake all of these things that were stumbling blocks in my life, all these things that were sin, and I'm going to change the way I think, I'm going to change the way I act, I'm going to change the way I live, and I'm going to become new. I don't think we talk about the newness enough about becoming a child of God. You're not going to be who you used to be. But you're going to be Christ. I love verse 17. Therefore, if any man be, now listen to this, in Christ. There's a big difference in knowing who Jesus is, knowing facts about who Jesus is, knowing about what Jesus has done for you, and being in Jesus Christ. A big difference in that. And I believe the key of this book is reminding these folks who are facing others, who are trying to get them to quit what Paul was telling them, which is through, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to stop living like Christ, but live like the world. But Paul was trying to tell them, you've changed, you're different, you're in Christ, and all the old things, listen to this phrase, they have passed away. Now, I don't want to be flippant or disrespectful, but at death, 
there is no coming back. Now that's how you and I changed our lives to be in Christ. So he's reminding them here, you've got to stay with the Lord. Now interestingly enough, 1 and 2 Corinthians proves to us that a congregation can be in a complete mess and turn things around to follow God again. You read 1 Corinthians. I encourage you to do this and notice how many times Paul is correcting something of which they needed to correct. How did they get that way? You ever thought about that for just a minute? How did they get that way? I would suggest a number of things to you. I would suggest to you that they became like the world because they let the world in. I believe these two books show us and help us understand the distinctiveness of the church, which is you and me, isn't it? Those who are in Christ, old things have passed away. When we live like the world in our regular everyday lives, I'm not talking about when we're not inside of worship. When we live like the world in our regular everyday lives and when we come to worship, we're going to live the same way. Because we can't keep that fake front on all the time. All things have to pass away. I believe they tried to live like the world. But number two, I believe they listened to the world. They listened to the world. I was listening to a sermon today preached by Charlie Myers, of which my son was named. And one of the points he was making in that sermon that was preached at West Sparta where I grew up when I was one year old was that the church was trying to listen to the world too much. And yet Corinth was doing it. Here's a big question for you and me. Are we? Are we? So you have inside of this all the general information. Now, in our general information, I have a bonus verse for you. Uh, this was a verse that I, I feel like we need to comment on. And it's a verse that I believe is very important uh, to what we do and to how we live. Go with me back to 1 Corinthians and go to chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Go all the way down to the end of this particular chapter. And I'm glad you're turning there in your Bibles. I want you to know where it is. I, I'm an electronic person. I love technology, but I, I love my paper Bible. And I hope you love yours too. I'm not saying it's wrong to use an electronic means. I do that all the time. But I like to, I like to feel where it is. I call it thumb memory. 1 Corinthians 14, 40, let all things be done decently and in order. Now, this was talking about worship in the scenes of what was happening as when they came together, and it was talking about spiritual gifts, but it tells us something. Everything that we do when it comes to offering worship to God should be done decently, reverently, respectfully. Those are words that our world doesn't like reverently and respectfully and in order. In other words, we should be able to recognize what's going on in the service and we should have no questions about what happened when we left. But I want to make a second application to this. I know it's being applied to worship in 1 Corinthians 14, 40, and I know that's how it should be and let it never be any different. But what if we made application of 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the idea, the premise in the verse to our lives? What if we lived our lives to where our marriages were decent and in order? What if we lived our lives to where our homes were decent and in order? What about now? Think about this one for you. We don't talk about this very often, but we should. What about our mental health? What about our mental stability? What, what if the things in our minds were decent and in order? You know, make this application to this as well. What about the things that we put into our lives? What if those things were decent, respectable, and in order? There's a great principle being laid down here. And, and I believe the principle is this. We've got to know where we're going. And I'll follow that up with this phrase. I do not believe Scripture teaches. I believe Scripture teaches the exact opposite of this. But I do not believe that Scripture teaches that there's going to be somebody who accidentally found themselves in heaven. Decently and in order. Everything God has done has been in order, hasn't it? Look at creation. 
Everything is lined out for us. Look at the Old Testament. Look at the way God brought about the Messiah. Everything was lined out. Look at the birth of Christ. Look at the death of Christ. And look at the conception. Look at the beginning of the church. God told the apostles where to be, what was going to happen, and they had to be there for those things to happen. It was decently in order. Everything that God does is in order where there are no questions about it. Look at creation for just a minute. The psalmist says that the heavens and the earth declare the glory of God. There's order there. Why do you think the sun keeps rising every morning and keeps setting every evening? There's order there. Why do you think we've not ever run out of water? I drink about seven or eight bottles of water a day. I appreciate water. I don't like to be thirsty, do you? You ever thought about this? What if we've run out of water? We're not going to because things are decently and in order. Now, let's get off that tangent and keep in this general information because that's the end of our general information. But if we apply that to our lives, I think it'll make a difference in the way we live, in the way we think, and in the way we prepare ourselves in our lives. Now, inside of this particular discussion, there's, there's some things I want you to see, and I call this the main matters. And, and what I've done is I, I've given you a simple outline. Now, what you can do is you can get one of our sheets. They're on the uh, racks on the doors, and there's some on the uh, table as well, and you can have this outline with you. Someone asked me as we got into these books specifically to, to give an outline of these books, and I'm calling these things the main matters of the books. Now, there's a much more detailed outline that could be given. But I think this helps inside of this particular area. Of course, you always have an introduction, verses 1 through 9. But you have in, in 1 Corinthians, and I want you to see this fall out. It's, it's much shorter in 2 Corinthians. But you have in 1 Corinthians a report about the Corinthian church. And that report was that they were divided, 1 Corinthians 10 through verse 17. Now, what does that mean? That means there was no unity there. Now, why is Paul writing this letter so there can be unity there? Also, this letter was being written so there could be unity where? Here. If it was good for the first century church, it's good for you and me. And he's dealing with the reasons also for this division. And those reasons vary for different things that were happening all the way through the first four chapters of this book. And then he answers this report, and this is 1 Corinthians 5. And he says that it's commonly reported that there's fornication among the church. Now, we've said in recent studies that it doesn't matter what the sin is, and that's true. That goes back to the key verses of these two chapters, doesn't it? Or these two books, doesn't it? 1 Corinthians 10 and even in the verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. That we are different, we're distinct inside of Christ. Should there, now listen to me real quick. Should there ever be sin in the church? Now, I'm not saying should there ever be a person who has to repent because they made a mistake, they made a bad decision. Should, should we ever live in sin? And the answer is we can't. If you're going to be in Christ, you can't be in Satan at the same time. Because to live in sin means you're living with Satan himself. You've been tempted. Remember 1 Corinthians 10? Remember God has made a way for you to escape it, to bear it? But yet... He says in verse 14, 1 Corinthians 10, flee fornication. I believe there's something happening about this division that we should recognize. So he answers the report about these things that are taking place. He goes on to give some counsel. I love this book in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He gives counsel concerning marriage. Chapter 8, all the way down to chapter verse 11. Now this one's or chapter 11, not verse 11, chapter 11. In this lengthy section of this book, he, he gives counsel concerning idols. What's that? Things we put in front of God. Is that not a problem today? It is a problem today. He gives counsel for worship. He gives counsel involving um, Christ. And he also gives counsel involving Jerusalem in chapter 16, verses 1 through 24, especially that collection that was being given there. You go to 2 Corinthians, the outline is much shorter. He has that introduction just like usual. But he talks about a change of plans. Now, this was Paul who was making some plans of ch change of plans for himself, for his missionary journeys that he was dealing with, for his life in which he was dealing with. And he gives his philosophy. Now, in Paul's philosophy, chapter 2, verse 14, down to chapter 6, verse 10, he realizes that his philosophy, which is the lifestyle that's inside of Christ, has to be what they believe. And that's the same for you and me. 
We've got to recognize the same things in our lives. So he pleads with them concerning what they've been doing and how they have been living and what was going on in their lives. He talks about this collection that was being taken up. Now, that particular scene also helps us understand why these books were written so close together. There were things that were going on. The church needed to deal with them. And I refer back to 1 Corinthians 14, 40, the principle there. They needed to be decent in what they were doing and in order. Get it done. If there's something that needs to be done, let's get it done. So there was this collection that had to be taken up. And then Paul answers his accusers. He defends his apostleship and he tells them that he wants to visit them and gives them the concluding factors therein. The main matters of First and Second Corinthians. Now I know that I wish we could spend more time in the main matters. But you and I both know that if we spent time in every one of these sections looking at just one verse out of every section we just looked at, we would be here till tomorrow. Now this morning I was told that I had the license to preach as long as I want. And tonight I was told that I better do the same. But I understand what it means to sit there. I do. Now let's look at the lessons learned. Two things I want you to see, and then it will be yours. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 13, and 1 Corinthians 15 are linked together in a way of which you cannot remove. They are talking about spiritual gifts, which I will make the point direct and firm. Spiritual gifts are no longer in existence. Miracles are no longer in existence. They had a meaning. They had a time, and it was to confirm the Word. We have the written Word. We don't need miracles to prove the Word. God's already proved His Word through the means of which He set out to prove them. So this particular section, if you're looking, if you just glance to, mine is open the same section, chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, chapter 12, verse 1. Chapter 13, though I speak with tongues, verse 1. Chapter 14, follow after charity, desire spiritual gifts. We know what we're talking about here. But chapter 13 has often been described as the love chapter. Now, I want to point, point out to this. If we do not recognize biblical love We've missed it. Now the question is, what is biblical love? Now, look at verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity. I, I like that word better than love. Because love to, to many of us is to invoke a reaction, but charity means I'm going to give you something. I love that old word. He said, I'm become as a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. I'm just as noise. If I can speak with the greatest tongues of men, if I can speak with the tongues of angels, and yet I do not understand love, I'm just as if it's noise going on out there. I'm just as noise that's going off, and it means nothing. Let me ask you this question. The sounding brass, what has it ever taught you? All right. The tinkling cymbal, what has that ever taught you? Okay. We get it, don't we? Now that has to do with love. Now the question becomes, what is love? Read on to verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love or charity, I am nothing. Keep reading verse 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. You know, many people would say love is helping others, and I believe that's a, that's a good thing to do, helping others. Love is helping them in their physical conditions. I, I believe it is. I think people say love is, and, and our love to God is, is doing the best we can with what we can. I believe that's verse 2. But it happens inside of verse 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. We learn what it is. Charity, it suffers long. Love is long-suffering. Charity is kind. Love or charity has your best interest at heart. Charity, love, it envies not. It's not jealous of you. Love or charity, it vaunteth not itself. It, it's not puffed up. It doesn't build you up so that you're the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's not love. Love, verse 5, does not behave itself unseemingly. Now notice this. Love has a proper action. You know, we hear about love in our world, and love usually, now 
I'm not saying everybody uses this definition, but a lot of folks in our world do. Love is usually connected to physical intimacy. That's not what love is. Now, physical intimacy is a part of marriage. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians. Physical intimacy is, 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 I would suggest to you, as you would, a large part of marriage in the scenes of that, but it is not love. It doesn't behave itself unseemingly. Love is an action. Love does not seek itself. Love or charity seeks after others. Love is not easily provoked and doesn't think evil. If we are true people who love, the way that's talking about here in 1 Corinthians 13, we're not easily provoked. We're not after getting the last word. Charity, verse 8, it never fails. You know, love in the face of all evil still stands. He says that here. I love verse 8. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. I believe those three areas are talking about the spiritual gifts that exist. In, and they're not going to last permanently. The spiritual gifts aren't. But love is. But love is. And he tells them that. So we, we get a definition of love. But, but I still have a, a great question to ask you because verse 13 still says in 1 Corinthians 13, Now abide these faith, hope, and charity in these three, but the greatest of these is charity. It's love. What is love? I have a definition for love from 1 Corinthians. Love is helping others go to heaven. That's what true love is. Isn't that the love that Jesus Christ had for you and me when he went to the cross? Isn't that the love of the Father? John 3, 16, for God so loved, it was eternal. It was heavenly love. I'll suggest to you that we have so many definitions of love that we don't even know what it is in our world anymore. But I know what biblical love is. It's when I want to go to heaven with you. And I'm telling you, if we miss that lesson, we miss it all. They wanted spiritual gifts, and they wanted to have the best ones ever. But Paul tells them it doesn't matter. He says, if you don't put each other first, if you don't go to heaven together, you've missed it all. I believe that's the true definition of real love. Not only that, I believe as you go to 2 Corinthians, you have 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, chapter 8 and chapter 9 have to do with giving. Now, the running joke is the preacher preaches about giving, giving goes down. I want to tell you something about giving. There are principles found in giving. There is a purpose for what we give to God. There, there are reasonable policies that we should deal with when it comes to giving, going down to verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 5. And, and there are promises found inside of giving. And I want you to pick up with me in 2 Corinthians 9. Pick up with me in verse 6. Now let me say something before I say this. I'm not telling you today that you give the Lord $1,000 and He'll give you $10,000. That's the prosperity gospel. You give God, He'll give you. You give God, He'll give you. That's the televangelist gospel. You see that on the television all the time. You call in with your love gift, your love offering, and God will bless your life exponentially. Now, I do believe in the principle found here because it's in Scripture. Look at what it says, verse 6. But I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. If you invest in heaven, I mean all in, you will be there. Now, I know 2 Corinthians 8 and 2 Corinthians 9 are talking about money, money. Get out your wallet, get out your money, money. But I want to make a little distinction in our minds about money, money. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. If you invest in heaven, you will be in heaven. Now, I am not saying, and neither is this passage right here, verse 6. This passage is not saying you give God your money and you will be in heaven. But it does tell you where you invest. And how you invest matters. 
Verse 7, every man according as he is purposed in his heart. When it comes to giving God anything, have you decided that that's what you need to do? When it comes to the offering we do on Sunday mornings, and for even when we miss Sunday morning due to work and other complications of life, and, and we give to the Lord on Sunday night, did you purpose that in your heart? And that's why I told you, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Because we're not giving money so that other people will know how much we give. We're not giving money so everybody can see how much we have or how much we can afford to give away. We're giving money because we purposed our hearts to God. And there's a big difference in those things there. And thus he says this, So let him give now that's an addition, that's an added text there. It, it brings us back to the purpose of the heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. He's asking you a kind of a rhetorical question here. Have you invested in heaven? I'm telling you, where you invest, heaven or hell, is where you will be. It's where I'm going to be. And let us not fake the value of what is happening inside of these things. God has given us everything. God has provided for us so that we could be His. And the real meaning of giving is not in money. Now listen, I, I'm here to tell you, it takes money to make the church operate. Every month, a light bill is going to come in. It happens at your home, too. Every money, a water bill is going to come in. That, that's got to be paid. I understand that. But every Lord's Day... Your purpose is remembered. Why do we give? Because there's a purpose that's in our hearts to God. It takes money to do everything that the Lord's church does. Evangelism, I'm here to tell you it takes money. To reach the lost, I'm, I'm, here, I'm not saying it relies on it or it depends on it. But you know what world we live in. Just as much as I can say your home requires money. Now I'm not saying we need to be greedy. But I am saying we've got to purpose in our hearts what we're doing and who we're doing it for. And if we miss that purpose, it's just like love. If we miss love, we, we've missed the whole point. And these two books, in First and Second Corinthians, teach us the lessons that we need to know in our lives. You know, it's about unity. And they were going to be unified together in the way that they lived, in the way they acted, in the way they worshipped, and where they were going. There is great unity among you and me about where we're going. That's heaven. There's a lot of unity there. Because to be in heaven means I followed the pattern that's inside of this book. Now, sometimes we go astray from that pattern. And First and Second Corinthians show us that the, the, the whole group of God's people had gone astray in what they were doing. But they came back. You read in 2 Corinthians that that man in 1 Corinthians 5, he comes back. And they correct a lot of the things that they, they had been doing and they had some other things they needed to deal with, but they turned to the Lord. And that's the reality we see in this book, the power of unity, being unified by Scripture to go to heaven together. Maybe tonight you need to become a child of God. Water's ready. The eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hindereth me to be baptized? Well, can I ask, well, can I, can, I, can I make a statement to you if you know you need to be baptized tonight? I really wish I could run back there and roll those curtains back. See, here is water. It's there. It was checked. Everything's prepared for you. Got some clothes for you to change into. But even more importantly, this book is willing to be opened you need to become a child of God, the answers are right here. Because there's some spiritual clothing you've got to put on. Remember 1 Corinthians 5, 17? You've got to put on those new things. All things are become new. Tonight you can become new if you need to be. Maybe you are a child of God and you need to make your life right with the Lord. That's a decision that you'll have to make. But we learn in this book we can come back home. Caleb has picked out a song for us to sing and we need to sing that song and consider our lives and recognize that no matter what we've done, we can still come back to the Lord. Let's stand and sing and respond to Corpus.